what are we eating? Now, it's this line of questioning that usually causes people to hide their food from me. But what you don't know may be hurting you. And my story is the discovery that what I was feeding my family was associated with my child's autism. I'm a mother and a biochemist, and these two worlds merged as I dove into the research of autism science determined to help my child's health. But what I discovered was not only associated with autism, but many chronic illnesses that plague our nation and world today. I'm the mother of five children, and I was devastated when my youngest, Brooke, I discovered that she had autism. She was diagnosed at the age of three and a quarter by a clinical psychologist as moderate on the autism spectrum. Now, what does that mean in terms of who was Brooke at this time? And she was a child in her own world. There was no eye contact. There was no interacting with others. There was no bonding. There was no playing with other children. Typical experiences that resulted in such joy were just expressionless on her face as she sits here on one of those toy trains in the mall. Her entire play consisted of arranging her animals in a repetitive, obsessive, particular way. And this was her entire play. She had no imaginary play. And you can see here, the cat's really confused as to where it fits into this arrangement. <laughs> her communication solely was about repeating words that she heard from songs or books. She didn't communicate like we think of communication. There was no conversation. She didn't understand questions. You couldn't ask questions. And typically, over the age of three, you're able to have a conversation with your child. You can understand what they're saying. And this didn't exist over the age of three. And here's an example. And she's looking into a video camera, so she's animated, again, in her own world, singing a song. So clearly, hard to understand. She's at a park. She has no interest in playing with other children. Her sensory perception distortions were so high that the world was constantly overstimulating all of her senses. Too much light was shielded, too much sound. Textures on her skin or her tongue seemed painful. Now, we tried a number of different therapies, including enrolling her in a special needs school, applied behavioral analysis, which is a common therapy. But what we found to be the most effective for Brooke was changing her diet. And what I want to walk you through is a journey of changing her diet in three phases and the observations that we noted with each one. And it's a reminder of how profound an effect that food has on the brain. The first, therapy, or the first phase that we tried was supplementing her diet with nutrients. I was surprised in doing nutritional research that our nation is plagued with nutritional deficiencies. An optimal brain function requires optimal nutrients. So I looked at what some of the common deficiencies were, as well as those associated with autism or speculated to be associated with autism, and came up with the following list. And manufacturing brand is also important. So I researched you know, which brands were the best. These were supplemented in our morning smoothie, which consisted of organic vegetables, fruits, nuts, seeds, herbs, all organic whole foods. And as time went on, we actually replaced these supplements with whole food nutrients, but that smoothie still remains as part of our routine today, probably not part of Brooke's favorite routine. Now, within days, we noted eye contact. And that was a significant milestone as if she's aware of her outside environment. And over the next few weeks, she became more responsive to her name. And people spoke, she would turn her head. Three weeks later, we implemented the gluten casein free diet. Now, there's no consensus as to the benefit of this diet on autism. But enough people had reported benefits that we thought it worth a try. Gluten is a class of proteins and removal of those required removal of wheat, barley, rye. Casein is a class of proteins found in milk, so it required the removal of all milk products. This was a significant change in our diet. And we tried this phase for six months, really giving us a good idea of the changes associated with this phase. And we noticed significant improvements. 
Her social skills and her communication skills started to improve and progress much faster. She became interested in her world, playing with other children. Her imaginary world opened up. Now, while social and communication skills still fell behind her peers, it was at least progressing. Imaginary play was now present. Her sensory perception distortions were still there, but milder. And her extreme repetitive behaviors were still there. And there was one repetitive behavior that was so dysfunctional, it was creating a severe family crisis. We just didn't know how to handle what to do, if there was even a way to prevent them. We called these behaviors the yes-no loop. And it was because she would be going through almost a seizure-like loop where her brain was stuck. Yes, I want this. No, I don't. A state of indecision. And she would go through this loop for hours. So it's not your typical temper tantrum that you see in two-year-olds. It was uncalm and would last for hours. And here's an example of this behavior. This is a two-hour episode. I yeah. want to get tough as a breaky spit. It's okay. It's on. It's on. Bucky's so this was a two-hour episode of whether we put the blanket on her bed, off her bed. It didn't matter. It was a state of indecision. We were still dealing with a dysfunctional behavior, despite all exhausting all therapies and being on the gluten casein-free diet. This behavior would require her to be in special needs. We couldn't visualize how she'd be mainstreamed or even lead an independent life. So I continued my research, and since thus far food on the brain had had the biggest impact with her, I continued along that line of research. Now, there wasn't much in the scientific publications with respect to this subject, but what I did notice was another pattern. And it wasn't just affecting autism or other disorders of the brain. It involved the whole body. And that is there's over a million scientific publications relating various diseases and disorders of the brain and the body associated with glutamate dysfunction. Billions of dollars are being spent on research, development, and marketing on drugs that block the activity of glutamate, called glutamate blocker drugs. So has suddenly our population lost the ability to balance glutamate? And this is just a small sampling of the diseases. Now, glutamate, simply put, is an amino acid. And we need glutamate. We manufacture or make glutamate in different areas of the body so that we can have it when we need it, where we need it, and in how much we need it. It serves various critical functions, such as activating our 50% of our nervous system. It activates glutamate receptors that are all over our body that regulate critical functions. And it's also involved in a number of critical metabolic functions. Now, we get glutamate in our food in two forms. One is bound glutamate. And here I have a simple depiction of a protein where each circle represents an amino acid, and in red is glutamate. This is considered bound because it's linked to, by amino acids in a series to make up a protein. We have evolved to consume and absorb our amino acids in a protein form. In this way, digestion is a slow, controlled release process into the blood. This is different than glutamate found free. That's just a single amino acid without link to other amino acids. And this is interchangeably used with the word monosodium glutamate. Monosodium glutamate is the most common type of glutamate, free glutamate in our foods because sodium is very present. But it matters not if it's bound to ammonium, potassium, magnesium. Free glutamate reacts in our body the same way. Now, free glutamate exists naturally in our whole foods at a fraction of a percent. So if free glutamate is natural, what's the issue? And the issue is excess. Like I said, free glutamate exists naturally in our whole foods at a fraction of a percent. That's different than some foods that contain free glutamate, 5, 10, 15, 20% free glutamate in those foods. Now, if you're consuming those foods throughout the day, 
day in and day out, you can start to get chronic activation of all of these different functions. And it's manifesting itself different in the population. So for example, right from the start, you can get chronic activation of mucus production, motility function, digestive processes. Free glutamate also absorbs into the blood much more rapidly because it's bypassing the digestive process. As a result, you can get surges in your blood resulting from high glutamate content in your food. And what most people don't know is, for example, both type 1 and type 2 diabetes is associated with excess glutamate. Let me go through the mechanism quick of type 2. We've got glutamate receptors on our pancreas that regulate the secretion of insulin in our blood. Overactivation can result in excess secretion of insulin in our blood, leading to insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. So this is the research that led me to phase 3, which was my experiment of what would happen if we reduced free glutamate in the diet. Now, if you asked me five years ago whether or not I consumed or fed my family MSG, I'd be like, no, I'm a healthy mama. I'm not feeding my kids that stuff, no. I was shocked. This was my unblind my mind experience. There's over 50 different ways that you can label MSG or free glutamate in our food. Have our manufacturers forgot how to spell MSG? Now, why are they enriching our food with MSG? And it's because it fakes our brain into thinking the food tastes good. It's a neurological reaction. Now, this list is shocking in and of itself, and it's not complete because I couldn't fit it all on there. Natural flavors, yeast extract. But the other thing that I noticed was there's a lot of protein processing on these lists. Protein extract, hydrolyzed protein, protein isolates, enriched proteins. And then it dawned on me, that's the gluten casein-free connection. Let me explain. I think that people are benefiting from removing gluten and casein because they're reducing their free glutamate load. Some are reacting to the proteins, but a lot of it is about reducing free glutamate load. Here's our typical protein, where it contains 6 to 7% glutamate in its bound structure. Gluten and casein have an unusually high level of free or, uh, glutamate bound in the protein, up to 25, 30% in this classes of protein. That's a high amount. But these are proteins not consumed in foods that we're pulling from the earth. These are foods that we are manufacturing in a laboratory. Ultra pasteurization, <gasps> enzyme modification, acid hydrolysis, fat removal process, and fermentation. All of these manufacturing processes start to break apart the amino acids, thereby freeing glutamate. And so I believe that people are benefiting by reducing glutamate. But now that I knew that there was many other sources because of that long list, there was still significant room for improvement for reducing glutamate. And so people say, well, what did you eat? <laughs> and it goes back to basics, that's right. Whole foods, cooking from scratch, and it takes a huge transition. Now, the week before I was ready to implement this diet, Brooke had had three of those yes-no behaviors. It was almost a showstopper. We were wondering, is, does she need more serious medical help? And is this the right time to remove more things from her diet? But we persevered. And the moment we implemented this diet moving forward, Brooke never again had one of those yes-no loops. Completely gone. Her social and communication skills quickly caught up with her peers. She was kicked out of her special needs school, which is like probably the only time a parent would be thrilled about their kid, kid being kicked out of school. And she is the most social and inquisitive child. Now, I'm not one of those mad mom scientists that only does experiments on their children. I, too, went through the reduced free glutamate diet. Couldn't believe the headaches that I constantly was living with, gone. Pollen allergies, gone. Digestive sensitivities, gone. So I started to tell anyone and everyone who would listen, as my poor family would attest to. And I couldn't believe some of the feedback. Migraines, digestive issues, pollen allergies, eczema, autism, ADHD, anxiety, depression. And so I decided to start a nonprofit to raise awareness of this issue. This experience has absolutely convinced me we are what we eat. But the question worth asking is, what are we eating? We have become so disconnected from our foods. 
So once you find out what you're eating, are you going to empower yourself, make the change, improve the quality of your life, and be all you can be? Now I leave you with this video of Brooke two years after implementing the diet, discussing her kindergarten experience, and the boys are chasing her. Can you tell me who your favorite friends are? My favorite friends are Elizabeth and Keone, and we like to play monsters with the boys. Oh, what's, how do you play monsters? Well, the boys have to taste us, and that's uh, like monsters, and then we have to run away. Oh, so are you guys ever monsters chasing the boys, or is it always the boys chasing the girls? Always the boys chasing the girls. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'm human, all too human. Trying to make some sense out of it all. Well, yes, I'm here.